Good morning, third grade. I, uh, I am missing you guys a lot. This not having a regular routine and not being in class is driving me crazy. Um, uh, you'll be proud. I'm still, you know, the gym is shut down, but I am running these country roads, working on it, still eating good, even though I'm locked up in this house. I uh, got my coffee here and I am ready to read. I, uh, yeah, I really miss being in school. And I got a couple notes from a couple of you uh, yesterday, and it made my whole day. If you want to do the writing prompt, you know, I'll still reply. I'll probably start checking those twice a day instead of like 12 times a day like yesterday. Um, I've got a teacher meeting this afternoon, uh, but keep it coming. I'm going to read the chapter. What chapter are we on? Chapter 7, The Boggart and the Wardrobe. Excuse me, remember that they just left... Oh, I've got Howard hair all over this book. Um, if you didn't watch the last video, you probably should because that'll explain it. Um, remember, they just left potions class with Professor Snape, and now they are um, heading up to their next class, which is like my favorite scene in the whole movie, and it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole book. So, Harry, Ron, and Hermione climbed the steps to the entrance hall. Harry was still thinking about what Malfoy had said, while Ron was seething about Snape. Five points from Gryffindor? Because the potion was all right. Why didn't you lie, Hermione? You should have said Neville did it all by himself. Hermione didn't answer. Ron looked around. Where is she? Harry turned too. They were at the top of the steps now, watching the rest of the class pass them, heading towards the Great Hall and lunch. She, she was right behind us. Where's Hermione? said Ron, frowning. Malfoy passed them, walking between Crabbe and Goyle. He smirked at Harry and then disappeared. There she is, said Harry. Hermione was panting slightly, hurrying up the stairs. One hand was clutching her bag, and the other seemed to be tucking something down the front of her robes. How, how did you do that? asked Ron. What? said Hermione, joining them. One minute you were right behind us, and the next moment you were back at the bottom of the staircase again. What? said Hermione, looked, looking slightly confused. Oh, I had, to go, I had to go back for something. Oh, no. A seam had split in Hermione's bag, so like her bag ripped where they sew it together, kind of like this is the seam of my shirt, the part where they sew together in the bag that had ripped open. Harry wasn't surprised. He could see that the bag was crammed with at least a dozen large, heavy books. Why are you carrying these all around with you? Ron asked her. You know how many subjects I'm taking, or classes I'm taking, said Hermione breathlessly. Could, could you hold these for me, please? But Ron was turning over the books she handed him, looking at the covers. You haven't got any of these subjects today. It's only Defense Against the Dark Arts this afternoon, which is a really cool class. Oh, yes, said Hermione vaguely, but she packed all the books back in her bag just the same. I hope there's something good for lunch. I'm starving, she added and she marched off in front of them towards the Great Hall. Do you get the feeling that Hermione's not telling us something? Ron asked Harry. Professor Lupin wasn't there when they arrived at their very first Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson. They all sat down, took out their books, quills, and parchment, and were talking when he finally entered the room. Lupin smiled vaguely and placed his tatty old briefcase on the teacher's desk. He was as shabby as ever, but looked healthier than he had on the train, as though he had had a few square meals. Good afternoon, he said. Would you please all put your books back in your bags? Today's lesson will be practical. You will only need your wands. Sounds like my kind of professor. A few curious looks were exchanged as the class put away their books. They had never had a practical defense against the dark arts lesson before unless you counted that memorable class last year where their old teacher had brought a cage full of Cornish pixies to class and set them loose. Uh, that was Professor Lockhart. Right then, said Professor Lupin when everybody was ready. If you'd follow me... What? Aiden V, what are you doing over there? What? He's cutting up a hundred little things. Eight could... Could you stop cutting things up underneath your desk, please? Just, I don't know what you're cutting on there. I don't know what it is. But, if, but, 
just don't make a mess. Do what you're going to do, just don't make a mess. Puzzled but interested, the class got to its feet and followed Professor Lupin out of the classroom. He led them along the deserted corridor and around a corner when the first thing they saw was Peeves, the poltergeist, who was floating upside down in midair and stuffing the nearest keyhole with chewing gum. Peeves didn't look up until Professor Lupin was two feet away. Then he wiggled his curly-toed feet and broke into a song. Looney, looney, loopin, Peeves sang. Looney, looney, loopin, looney, looney, loopin. Rude and unmanageable, as he almost always was, Peeves usually showed some respect towards the teachers. Everyone looked quickly at Professor Lupin to see how he would take this. To, to their surprise, he was still smiling. I'd take that gum out of the keyhole if I were you, Peeves, he said pleasantly. Mr. Filch won't be able to get in to get his brooms. Filch was the Hogwarts caretaker, a bad-tempered failed wizard who waged a constant war on the students and indeed also on Peeves. However, Peeves paid no attention to Professor Lupin's words except to blow a loud, wet raspberry. <laughs> Professor Lupin gave a small sigh and took out his wand. This is a useful little spell, he told the class over his shoulder. Please watch closely. He raised his wand to his shoulder height and said, Wadawasi, and pointed it at Peeves. With the force of a bullet, the wad of chewing gum shot out of the hole and straight down Peeves' left nostril, and he whirled right up and zoomed away, cursing. Very cool, sir, said Dean Thomas in amazement. Thank you, Dean, said Professor, putting his wand away again. Shall we proceed to the lesson? They set off again, the class looking at shabby Professor Lupin with increased respect. He led them down a second hallway. Whoop, where'd they go? And stopped right outside the staff room door. Inside, if you'll please, said Professor Lupin, opening it and standing back. The staff room, a long paneled room full of old mismatched chairs, was empty except for one teacher. Professor Snape was sitting in a low armchair, and he looked around as the class filled in. His eyes were glittering, and there was a nasty sneer behind his mouth. As Professor Lupin came in and made to close the door behind him, Snape said, Leave it open, Lupin. I'd rather not witness this. He got to his feet and strode past the class, which means like he walked at a fast pace past the class, his black robes billowing or waving behind him. At the doorway, he turned on his heel and said, Possibly no one's warned you, Lupin, but this class contains a student, Neville Longbottom. I would advise you not entrust him with anything difficult, not unless Miss Granger is hissing instructions in his ears. Neville turned scarlet red. Obviously, he turned scarlet red because he's embarrassed. Harry glared at Snape. It was bad enough that he bullied Neville in his own class, let alone doing it in front of other teachers. Professor Lupin had raised his eyebrows. I was hoping that Neville would assist me with the first stage of the whole operation, he said, and I'm sure he will perform admirably. Neville's face went, if possible, even redder. Snape's lip curled, but he left, shutting the door with a snap. Now then, said Professor Lupin, beckoning the class towards the end of the room where there was nothing except an old wardrobe. So like a kind of a standalone closet. It's a closet that has legs. It's kind of a rectangular shape. You open it up and put coats in it. It's just not built into a wall. They were very common um, in these times and kind of in history. If you think of like the Chronicles of Narnia, if you've seen that movie, the, um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the wardrobe is what Lucy goes into. So there's a wardrobe at the end of this staff room and um, that's what they're walking towards which the teachers kept their spare robes in. As Professor Lupin went to stand next to it, the wardrobe gave a sudden wobble, banging off the wall. Nothing to worry about, said Professor Lupin calmly as a few people jumped back in alarm. There's a boggart in there. Most people seemed to feel that this was something to worry about. Neville gave Professor Lupin a look of pure terror, and Seamus Finnegan eyed the now rattling doorknob apprehensively. D Davis, D what are you doing? Yes. You just gonna walk back there? Just gonna, just gonna walk in the back of the. All right. Just, 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 please don't distract anybody. 
All right, yeah, keep walking. Do you, do you, boo. Uh, Boggarts like dark enclosed spaces, said Professor Lupin. Wardrobes, the gap beneath beds, the cupboards under sinks. I once met one that had lodged itself in a grandfather clock. This one moved in yesterday afternoon, and I asked the headmaster if the staff would leave it to give my third year some practice. So the first question we must ask ourselves is, what is a boggart? Hermione put her hand up. It's a shapeshifter, she said. It can take the shape of whatever it thinks will frighten us the most. Couldn't have put it better myself, said Professor Lupin, and Hermione glowed. So the Boggart, sitting in the darkness within, has not yet assumed a form. He does not yet know what will frighten the person on the other side of the door. Nobody knows what a Boggart looks like when it's all alone. But when I let him out, he will immediately become whatever each of us fears the most. This means, said Professor Lupin, choosing to ignore Neville's small splutter of terror, Ooh that we have a huge advantage over the Boggart before we even begin. Have you spotted that advantage, Harry? Trying to answer a question with Hermione next to him bobbing up and down on the balls of her feet with her hands in the air was very off-putting, like very difficult to do, something he didn't want to. But Harry had a go, so Harry had a try. Er, because there are so many of us here, it won't really know what shape to take? Precisely, said Professor Lupin, and Hermione put her hand down, looking a little disappointed. It's always best to have company when you're dealing with a boggart. It becomes confused. Which, which should it become? A headless corpse or a flesh-eating slug? I once saw a boggart make a, that very mistake, trying to fight, frighten two people at once, and he turned himself into half a slug. Not remotely frightening. The charm that repels a boggart is simple. Yet it requires force of mind. You see, the thing that really finishes a Boggart off is laughter. What you need to do is force it to assume the shape you find most amusing. We will practice the charm without wands first. After me, please. Ridiculous. Ridiculous, the class said together. The wardrobe shook again. Good, said Professor Lupin. Very good, but that was the easy part, I'm afraid. You see, the word alone is not enough. And this is where you come in, Neville. The wardrobe shook once again, though not as much as Neville, who walked forward as though he was heading towards the gallows, so like to certain death. Um, right, Neville, said Professor Lupin. First things first, what would you say the thing is the thing that frightens you most in the world? Neville's lips moved, but no sound came out. D I didn't catch that, Neville. Sorry, said Professor Lupin cheerfully. Neville looked around rather wildly, as though begging someone to help him. Then, in barely more than a whisper, he said, Professor Snape? Nearly everyone laughed. Even Neville grinned apologetically. Professor Lupin, however, looked thoughtful. Professor Snape? Hmm. Neville, I believe you live with your grandmother, is that correct? Uh, yes, said Neville nervously. But, but, but I don't want it to turn into her either. No, no, you misunderstand me, said Professor Lupin, now smiling. I wonder, could you tell us what sort of clothes your mother usually, your grandmother usually wears? Neville looked startled, but said, well, always the same hat. A tall one with a stuffed vulture on top. And a long dress, green normally, and sometimes a fox fur scarf. And a handbag, prompted Professor Lupin. Oh, a big red one. She always carries it, said Neville. Right then, said Professor Lupin. Can you picture those clothes very clearly, Neville? Picture them in your mind's eye. Yes, said Neville uncertainly, plainly wondering what was coming next. When the Boggart bursts out of this wardrobe, Neville, and sees you, it will assume the form of Professor Snape, said Lupin, and you will raise your wand thus and cry, Ridiculous! And concentrate hard on your grandmother's clothes. If all goes well, Professor Boggart Snape will be forced into that vulture-topped hat and green dress with a big red handbag.
There was a great shout of laughter. The wardrobe wobbled even more violently than the times before. If Neville is successful, the Boggart is likely to turn her attention to each of us in turn, said Professor Lupin. I would like all of you to take a moment now to think of the thing that scares you most and imagine how you might force it to look comical. The room went quiet. Harry thought, what scared him most in the world? Ca Callie. Callie. Yep. You, you don't have to totally pay attention to the book. I get that. Read aloud is free time, but some free time, but playing with your watch that you got for Christmas, not a, not an option for today. So hands, yep, hands off the, just like that, hands off the watch. And if you need to put it in your bag uh, to keep yourself con like focused, go ahead and do that. But not, not during this time. Thank you. All right, where was I? I would like you all to take a moment now to think of the thing that scares you the most and put the watch away, put it in your bag in your bag. And imagine how you might force it to look comical. The room went quiet. Harry thought, what scared him most in the world? His first thought was Lord Voldemort. A Voldemort returned to full strength. But before he had even started to plan a possible counterattack on the bogger Voldemort, a horrible image came floating to the surface of his mind. A rotting, glistening hand slithering back beneath a black cloak a long rattling breath from an unseen mouth. Then a cold, a cold so penetrating, it felt like drowning. I hope you know what he's thinking of. Harry shivered, then looked around, hoping no one else had noticed. Many people had their eyes tight, sh shut tight. Ron was muttering him to himself, take its legs off, take its legs off. Harry was sure he knew what Ron was thinking about. Ron's greatest fear was spiders. Everyone ready, said Professor Lupin. Harry felt a lurch of fear. He wasn't ready. How could you make a Dementor less frightening? Okay, I hope you caught on that. What Harry was afraid of most was a Dementor. But he didn't want to ask for more time. Everyone else was nodding and rolling up their sleeves. Neville, we're going to back, aw we're going to back away, said Professor Lupin. Let you have a clear field, all right? I'll call the next person forward when he's done. Everyone back now so Neville can have a clear shot. They all retreated, backing against the walls, leaving Neville alone beside the wardrobe. He looked pale and frightened, but he had pushed up the sleeves of his robe and was holding his wand ready. On the count of three, Neville, one, two, three. Professor Lupin flicked his wand and the wardrobe came open. A jet of sparks shot from the end of his wand and hit the doorknob. The wardrobe burst open. I read that wrong, I'm sorry. Hook-nosed and menacing, Professor Snape stepped out of the wardrobe, his eyes flashing at Neville. Neville backed away, his wand up, mouthing wordlessly. <sighs> Snape was bearing down upon him, reaching inside his own robes. <laughs> Ridiculous! Squeaked Neville. There was a noise like a whip crack. Quack. Snape stumbled. He was wearing a long, lace-trimmed dress and a towering hat topped with a moth-eaten vulture and swinging a huge crimson handbag from his hand. There was a roar of laughter from the crowd. The Boggart paused, confused, and, the prof and Professor Lupin shouted, All right, Parvati, come forward! Parvati walked forward, her face set. Snape rounded on her. There was another crack, and where had stood, where Snape had stood, was a blood-stained, bandaged mummy. Its sightless face was turned to Parvati, and it began to walk towards her very slowly, dragging its feet, its stiff, stiff arms rising. Ridiculous! cried Parvati. A bandage unraveled at the mummy's feet, and it became entangled, fell face forward, and its head rolled off. Seamus, come forward! roared Professor Lupin. Seamus darted past Parvati. Crack! Where the mummy had been was a woman with floor-length black hair and a skeletal green-tinged face, a banshee. She opened her mouth wide, and an unearthly sound filled the room, a long, wailing shriek which made the hair on Harry's head stand on end. Ridiculous! cried Seamus. The banshee made a rasping noise and clutched her throat. Her voice was gone. Crack! The banshee turned into a rat, which chased its tail in a circle. Then crack! Became a rattlesnake which slithered and withered before crack, becoming a single bloody eyeball. 
It's confused, shouted Lupin. We're getting there. Dean! Dean hurried forward. Crack! The eyeball became a severed hand, which flipped over and began to creep along the floor like a crab. Ridiculous, yelled Dean. There was a snap, and the hand was trapped in a mouse trap. Excellent, Ron, you're next. Ron leapt forward and crack. Quite a few people screamed. A giant spider, like the one they saw in the forest last year. Six feet tall and covered in hair was advancing on Ron, clicking its pinchers menacingly. For a moment, Harry thought Ron had frozen. Then, ridiculous, Ron bellowed, and the spider's legs vanished and it rolled over. Lavender Brown squealed and ran out of its way and came to a halt at Harry's feet. He raised his wand ready, but here, shouted Professor Lupin suddenly running forward. Crack, the legless spider had vanished. For a second, everyone looked wildly around to see where it was. Then they saw, so if you didn't catch on to that, if I read that too fast, it was Harry's turn. And then all of a sudden, Professor Lupin darted in front of him and was like, nope, I'm going to go. <laughs> so Professor Lupin's biggest fear the legless spider had vanished. For a second, everyone looked wildly around to see where it was. Then they saw a silvery white orb hanging, uh, so a big white um, sphere orb, hanging in the air in front of Lupin, who said, ridiculous, almost lazily, crack, forward Neville and finish him off, said Lupin as the boggart landed on the floor as a cockroach, crack, Snape was back. This time, Neville charged forward, looking determined. Ridiculous, he shouted, and they had a split second's view of Snape in his lacy dress again before Neville let out a great ha of laughter, and then the bogart exploded. Burst into a thousand tiny wisps of smoke and was gone. Excellent, cried Professor Lupin as the class broke into applause. Excellent, Neville, well done. Let me see, five points to Gryffindor for every person to tackle the bogart. Ten for Neville, because he did it twice, and five each to Hermione and Harry. But I didn't do anything, said Harry. You and Hermione answered my questions correctly at the start of the class, Harry, said Lupin lightly. Very well, everyone, an excellent lesson. For homework, kindly read the chapter on Bogarts and summarize it for me, to be handed in on Monday. That will be all. Talking excitedly, the class left the staff room. Harry, however, wasn't feeling cheerful. Professor Lupin had deliberately stopped tackling the bogart, had deliberately stopped him from tackling the bogart, or facing the bogart, not actually tackling him, but like going against him with his wand. Why? Was it because he had seen Harry collapse on the train and he thought he wasn't up to it? He, had he thought that Harry would pass out again? That he was weak? But no one else seemed to have noticed it. It wasn't bothering anyone. Did you see me take on that banshee, shouted Seamus. And the hand, said Dean, waving his own around. And Snape in that hat. And my mummy. I wonder why Prefer Professor Lumen Lupin is frightened of crystal balls, said Lavender thoughtfully. That was the best defense against the dark arts lesson we've ever had, wasn't it? Said Ron excitedly, as they made their way back to the classroom to get their bags. He seems like a very good teacher, said Hermione approvingly. But I wish I would have had a turn with the boggart. What would it have been for you, said Ron, sniggering, a piece of homework that only got 9 out of 10? And I'm sorry that this video lasted so long, crazy long, 23 minutes. Um, I just wanted to finish the chapter, and we did it. Uh, if you'll notice, I, um, you know, I'm missing you guys. I'm trying to make the read-alouds more realistic, so I'm calling you out like I would in class, you know? Um, and I will make sure to call out everybody uh, at some point, I'm sure. Uh, I hope you guys have a great day. Um, feel free to send me emails about what you're doing, pictures or snaps or videos or, um, you know, uh, anything that you want to. And I will be sure to reply. I'll talk to you soon. Wish me luck on my teacher meeting. Be good for your parents. Beep, beep. I'm a sheep.